Welcome to the Comic Fest 2017. <laughs> My name is Nelson uh, DeCastro. Um, I've been uh, working for Marvel and DC for about 27 years now. Uh, I've worked on uh, a lot of titles, <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, to be honest, like I, I don't even really remember how many there are because you jump around a lot. Tend to uh, usually be a, uh, most artists for Marvel or DC or any of those companies are freelancers. Right? So, uh, and you tend to work on projects usually in spurts, that sort of thing. You work from home. Um, so the title of this uh, panel was Creating Epic Comics. And uh, I think they also had a, a basis on kind of creating your own, create your own comic thing. Are, are anybody here creates their own stuff? Or does anyone, I know you do, right? Who else? You as well? Anybody else? Does anybody here want to create their own comic book? OK. And what has been keeping you from doing that so far? Time. Time. Time is a, a, a very important resource when, when doing comics, right? Um, comics take an enormous amount of time to do. That's usually the reason why, as a matter of fact, that they have uh, many people who work on a team drawing comics, right? It's very common to have a writer who writes just the scripts, penciler who pencils the, the pages, an inker who inks the pages, a letterer who just letters the pages, just doing that. Uh, colorist who colors the book, you know, and of course then an editor and stuff to keep an eye on and make sure everything is, uh, you know, uh, mistake free and that sort of thing. So it's a very uh, uh, common thing to have uh, a lot of people working on one project. And if you don't have a lot of people working on one project, it can take a lot of time. I saw you'd had two issues of stuff and it wasn't, wasn't easy to do, right? Yeah, it takes a lot of time. So speed is the number one thing that's important. And of course, you know, if you have a job or you're going to school to put, to, you know, put out an issue of a comic, it takes, it's, it takes a bit, right? Well, first off, you've got to realize that comic books are very close to films, right? Um, you are telling a story, uh, you are manipulating the audience, you are uh, basically allowing them to have information that only you want them to have when you want them to have it. And you are technically leading them around, right? Like a good mystery writer never gives you the information that you need to to solve the case, right? They give you these interesting clues and they make you think the butler did it, right? Or they don't want you to think the butler did it. In the end, of course, the butler always does it, right? Okay? Um, and that's kind of the whole point. And, and doing comics, being, being a great artist, uh, is definitely something very, very important uh, when you want to be a professional comic book artist. But uh, an even more important aspect to making comics is being a great storyteller, right? giving the audience the information they, uh, that they need to really get lost inside the story, right? And, and giving this important information and feeling through the story. So let's take a, um, uh, let's take a Mad Max scenario, right? Okay? And first off, one of the most important things in any uh, story is, is the establishing shot, right? Which in usually in one panel lets the reader know as soon as they see the first thing, okay, who, what, where, when, and what's going on? What time of day is it? Where are we in the desert? Are we in a suburban neighborhood? Are we in an urban neighborhood? Are we inside a, a business office? Are we in the back of a library? Are we at a gas station, right? Is it day? Is it night? Is it early morning? Is it dawn? That's sometimes, is it dawn or is it dusk, right? That, which can be confusing, right? These things, so to establish that sort of stuff. And then usually to slowly move in and begin to uh, kind of concentrate on the characters. You guys ever see the movie Poltergeist? You ever see that Steven Spielberg movie, right? The, the classic opening scene, and Spielberg was a great storyteller. You know, the camera is way up high in one of those cranes that they use to film this scenario. And you see this nice suburban neighborhood, and it's, uh, it's 
about five o'clock, you know, kind of the end of the day a little bit, and the kids are playing on the streets and they're riding their bikes and having fun, and the mailman is waving as he's, you know, walking there, and you see a car coming in the distance, right? And as the car comes closer, the camera slowly comes down, and you can see now, you know, less of the entire overall scene. They're kind of focusing in a little bit more on the car and some of the streets, and as the car comes closer, it gets lower and lower. Now we're focusing clearly on the car that's driving down the street, right? And as the car turns into the driveway, now the camera zooms in to look through the car, and we see the driver guy coming into the driveway, right? And then he comes out of the car, throws his jacket, it over his shoulder you can clearly see now which house is that car you know the uh, the owner of the car which house it belongs to clearly the guy is getting off of work he's got his jacket his briefcase right so we started with giving an idea of the neighborhood and how nice it is and how beautiful it is which is important for later on because it turns into a haunted house of horrors right so the shocking uh, change that you're going to be in for where we have this lovely super nice neighborhood now it's filled with demons and ghosts and stuff and and <laughs> children walking into the light and scary clowns and stuff like that right so uh let's take a mad max scenario right we'll call it this mad max 25 right okay so your your main opening scene you know maybe something like this where you have a panoramic shot showing a lot of information there, right? And you have this sort of ridge-like cliff, and on the top of the cliff maybe you see uh, Mad Max's car with that V8 interceptor thingy on the top there, right? Yeah, the door is open, like so. Right. And again in this, you want to control what the reader really sees. Right. You want to use maximum drama to hide what the reader sees until you're ready for them to understand what's going on and what's important. Right. So in this scenario, for example, in fact, maybe you'll even have uh, a rock over here and on the rock, you'll have uh, some sort of lizard, right? That's my shitty little lizard over here, right? Pardon my French. <coughs> hey, what's up? I'm a lizard. <coughs> I'm a lizard. Always get reference of lizards, all right? That's another thing, too, comic artists. You have to make sure that you know what everything looks like, right? Now, over here, we're going to have our character, right? And we're going to have someone that you can't really see his face. First off, we're going to have the sun coming from the back. So the figure here is sort of our shadowy figure. Right? Sort of mysterious. We don't know what he's doing. He's got his arms up. What looks like he's might, you know, maybe holding binoculars. In that pose, it's pretty, pretty similar to somebody who's holding binoculars, but we can't really see that. We clearly can't see his face. Right? You know, maybe he's got this little cute dog, Mad Max's dog, which is Dog Max, All right? Okay. All right. We have the sun in the sky showing what time of day it is. In the back over here, the ridge mountains, you can see these other mountains like so, All right? And clearly it's the desert, all sort of rocky terrain and stuff like that, All right? The lizard definitely tells you maybe there's a little snake over here. Yeah, I'm a snake, All right? Okay. We don't see much here. We don't know much, right? We have our shadowy figure. We don't have much information there, right? These lone figures, we see this sort of desolation like that. The next panel, sort of a different story, right? The next panel, we zoom in. We still don't want to show you who he is, right? We want, we want to save it for the reveal, right? So in this shot, now we're going to start to zoom in. We've seen some information. Now we're going to move in and see more information, more pertinent information, right? Now we're going to get our binoculars over here, right? He's going to be holding those binoculars. We still can't see his face. We can see maybe his hairline. Right. You can see his sleeve here. Right. You can see his leather jacket with the lapels, maybe those kind of zippers on there. Right. 
You can see the bottom of his chin, maybe a mouth or something. And chances are you want to make sure that the, the binoculars themselves are dropping a shadow on the face. So you can't see that either. Right? Not only do we have this black leather jacket like so, that's dropping a shadow under the chin. Right? And we really just can't see who the heck this guy is. We don't want you to know really who it is. Okay. We start with that bleak, sort of desert-like, scary scenario. Of this middle of nowhere desert like that. Okay. And maybe we even keep the dog over here. Put the dog in front a little bit, maybe. Sorry about that area there. It's a little tongue out. Right, he's doing the panting, right? Mad Max dog. But we still don't see who he is, right? And we know that now if he's, we have the shot and he's holding binoculars, which we, we suspect he is, but then again, you have to remember in a small comic book panel like that, you can't assume that the reader is gonna see that and know that that's him holding binoculars. We know that sort of uh, pose like that is very, he's, he's either rubbing his eyes and crying and saying, this is terrible, and it's my birthday, <laughs> and only the dog showed up, right? Which would be pretty sad, but dogs are fun to hang out with on your birthday, right? So in this one here, maybe you want to put some reflections on the, on the lenses, and you can definitely see, okay, now we can clearly see that we don't know who this guy is, but we can clearly see that he's uh, looking through these binoculars here. Again, I may want to show that sun behind him as well. Again, I might want to put some of the cliffs in the background like so to verify again, maybe f some light clouds or something like that maybe. All right, okay. So I'm still showing this again, the dog again, right? Got rid of the lizard because that's a stupid looking lizard. Get rid of stuff when you don't know how to draw it. Make sure you don't just just don't draw it, right? I'll show you how to how to how to draw crowd scenes without having to draw crowds. It's called cheating, <laughs> right? So in this shot, we've now established that this guy's looking through these binoculars, right? So if I do a shot like this, we've seen this a million times, right? In the movies, when someone's looking through binoculars, yes, right? We've seen that, right? You're gonna have to black out all this area here, right? So now we've established that someone's looking through binoculars and now we do the binocular view. So this is something that the reader should be able to pick up quite easily, that what we're seeing here in this view is what our hero over here, our mysterious shadowy figure is seeing, right? And in the distance, of course, what we see is smoke coming off the, the distance here like so, right? and we see this sort of road leading into the distance, right, in between the cliffs here. Right. And maybe on the road we start to see these caravan of trucks and, right, it's all those bad guys that you see, Lord Humongous and Lord Semi-Largest, right? right, and the smoke there coming from the the area there, and you can see with the smoke trailing behind, and this place is clearly burning up, that they may have attacked some sort of outpost or something, right? Okay. And of course, in this panel here is where you're gonna have the reveal, right? In this one now, we can pull away and take down the, the binoculars, and who do we see? Mel Gibson, right? Or <laughs> The younger guy who's not as anti-Semitic, right? Okay, what's that guy's name? Uh, he's, he's good. He's good, that guy, I like him, all right? Right, this is the reveal where we see our hero, right? And if you're a fan of the Mad Max movies, you're like, yeah, Mel, go kick his ass. Yeah, woo, Mel, Mel's back. All right? And of course, in this shot is where you can show that intensity, right? Here's where you can show his teeth grinding, right? That 
sort of intense look on his face. We pull the binoculars away. And now you can clearly see who he is, right? And that's the reveal. And also there's something about the tension in his eyes, right? The fear or anger, whichever sort of uh, look you want to uh, give him, the intensity there, it tells you something of, of his concern that these cannibalistic mutant desert dweller dog eaters are going to eat his dog, jerks. You just can't trust cannibals in the desert nowadays. Back in the old days, they were trustworthy, right? If they said, we're not going to eat your baby, they wouldn't. But nowadays, you just can't trust them. All right, that was ridiculous. All right, all right. So here we go. Here's his leather jacket here. All right. All right. The information that you're deriving from his face cannot be derived in a panel this small or this small. It can only be saved for when you're moving into this area now, right? And we can only really get this close into this guy after we've shown enough information, right? So not only do we reveal what's going on, then the look on his face is telling us about what this is. Is this dangerous? Is this sinister? Of course it is because he's so concerned Right? And so angry or outraged or scared or terrified or uh, worried that we know that it has told us that whatever that is, it's really bad. Right? So that village there could be uh, where his, him and his wife were situated and they just came back from ransacking the place and murdering his wife and setting his daughter on fire or something terrible or, or not saving those coupons for that laundry detergent, which is just as bad as murdering somebody. Because laundry detergent is really expensive nowadays. And I'm sorry, sometimes I go on these tangents. You're gonna have to forgive me, right? All right? And again, what I may show one more time again is the dog here as well. goofiest dog I've ever drawn in my life. All right, a little tail over here. Watch out, don't make it look like this is smoking or on fire, right? You gotta be careful what things you put next to other things, right? People can get to. Do you think it's a good idea to put in the desert cliff again? What do you think? Of course, absolutely. Redoing it each time, and every time I move it, I'm kind of keeping it consistent, right? If there's some sort of weird cliff over here, Right, like one of those high cliffs like that, then that should be in here as well again, right? That should be, you probably wouldn't see it from this angle because this one we're looking up a little bit more this way. What do you think, correct? Right? In fact, we see the sun over here. Will we see this over here or no? No, not at all, right? So you have to think of also the 3D orientation of where you're placing things, right? And then of course, the next page that you're going to have is going to be, what are you gonna reveal here? What do you think? What do you think it would be? At the caravan, absolutely, right? We see a little bit of what's going on there, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, perhaps the two-page spread is what you'd go for of the caravan, right? And now, what he's seen, what we start to see in the distance, right? Which we couldn't make out these little things in, that, in the binoculars. And then we see the look on his face. And then we reveal, not only do we reveal him, that it's Mad Max, look out, it's Mad Max, cool. Then we see the horrors that he's witnessing. He knows what that is. He's double checking. We don't know what it is until now, right? And then we see the caravan coming down the road and we see these giant uh, big rig trucks kind of powering down the road here, right? Driven by Lord Humongous and Lord Dungus or whatever, which is his little brother. Right? And here are these big trucks with the wheels like that. And this is the fun part. This is where, as a cartoonist, 
or comic book artist is where you get to really have fun. And you think, well, what's in this scene, right? What do, what do you put on this to make it really scary, right? And then you realize that there should be these severed heads, right, on the front, just glued or sewn on here, just the skulls of their enemies, right, on the top of the trucks, spikes that shoot out the side maybe, right? Uh, maybe there's a guy over here who they just sort of attached to the side of the truck like this, right? And they just shot arrows into this guy for the hell of it, right? Just shot him up with bullets all over, especially in the crotch area, which is really mean. Like, geez, wow, you guys are not nice, right? Okay. In fact, maybe they shot like his arm so much that the, the arm kind of broke off a little bit. And here's like the, his arm and this part's like blood all over there, right? And he's like, ow, ow, right? Okay, what else could you have? Again, like little pikes with skulls on them, all different kinds of things. Maybe on top here, there's a, a gunner guy with a Gatling gun, right? With that hockey mask on, right? And this is where you really have the, the sort of fun with this, with the smoke, and those pipes maybe coming from there. But also you need to know what these things look like too, right? If you need to know what kind of truck that is. How big is that mirror on the side of those big 18-wheeler trucks, right? They're very large, very, almost about this big, right? How they mount on there, that sort of information. Where that door handle is for that sort of truck, right? How many wheels are on this truck? Are there two here? Are there, is there another set here? Where are they, right? And then you might want to have some guys over here riding the motorcycles, right? Accompanying the caravan. And of course, on the front, what do they have? A severed head of thine enemy, right? Some skull stuff, maybe with a, some horn things, right? You want to make it as terrifying as possible, right? And of course, he's got his hockey mask thing, right? And he's got some spikes on it, right? As he rides his devil cycle, right? The trick to getting motorcycles, too, is First drawing the, and understanding the shape and position of the wheels in the perspective, right? We've already picked a certain kind of perspective. Can you guys see that? Yeah. All right, all right. So you have to match the other things on the road to that perspective as well, right? So if I'm doing an extremely distorted two-point perspective like so, I need to match these sorts of things. Perspective is one of the most uh, underrated and most important aspects of drawing. Uh, and I, I, I'm amazed when a lot of the artists uh, approach me and they really don't know much about perspective when it is crucial, especially drawing out of your head to understanding the rules of perspective in order to create the correct feel. Now, number one, by the way, I just realized the truck is higher than the wheels. So this has to go like that in order for the wheel to go under the truck. This other wheel for the motorcycle would probably be somewhere like this, following, you guys see this angle here? Going off into that perspective, do you see that? Going off into what they call the vanishing point. So, this one being smaller in the back gives us that feeling of distance, how this one is in front of this one, right? Then you have to think about where the gas tank is and the motor and the engine and stuff, and then you can place the guy's leg over this like so and where his foot would go. First you have to understand where the gas tank would fit, the motor, that sort of thing. Right? And then you can place the figure of this bike riding cannibal over there like so. Right? Okay. And of course you might want to have smoke coming from this sort of thing, more spikes and stuff. And, and when you get that, now you've got the pacing. Right? This sort of quiet uh, open scenario, showing you some information like that, right? We zoom in a little bit more to confirm what we think we see, right? We're getting closer to our character who we're really beginning to focus in what we're dealing with and who we're dealing with, right? And now we're dealing with what he's dealing with. We get to see this, but still it's a little bit shrouded in mystery. We can't really tell much about what's going on there, right? And over here, we've revealed Mad Max, who has bad teeth. He really needs to see a dentist. Sorry about that. Sorry, Mel. My bad. Right? Maybe he has some uh, uh, 
5 o'clock shadow, right? right? And then we wonder what he's seeing, and then that's the big reveal, right? And here we go, boom, right? Now, for example, and I, I don't know if you guys can hear this. I'll see if I... I wrote a little music to this. And you tell me if this reminds you of what you would see. If this were a film, we'd have to break this up into many more different scenes. In comics, it's cool we have like a visual shorthand because we just need to give you the information to get you understanding what's going on, right? If we were doing film, it would be a different story. You'd need a lot more uh, information. Try and think of this like a soundtrack to a film. And these are films, right? We just cut down the amount of visual information, so. Quiet sort of solace, right? Maybe we zoom in here, right? Slowly zooming into this character. And in this scene, change of pace, ready? All right, this would be a lot more cuts if it's a film, right? And then here we go for the reveal of Mel. A little bit of sinister. Removes the binoculars. Now we see, ooh, it's Mel, right? Okay? And of course, here comes in the... Mm. Right. Tummy, now you see the film coming alive, right? Once you have the music in there, right? Okay. Right. I'm sorry this is like not loud enough, right, sorry, but, all right, all right, but now all of a sudden when you start putting in something like this to that, all of a sudden it starts to feel like a movie, right? And that's what it is. Now, if I was, um, I'm doing actually a little version of this with what the film version would be, how many different cuts of him maybe looking at the dog or the dog looks up at him as he's still looking and a couple back and forths and the scene with the binoculars where the, he sees something, then it goes behind the rocks and then it pops up again and then you can see more that it's, probably something more dangerous. And then again, when we see these guys marauding, we have that kind of you know, dangerous sort of sound. So this is what you want to look for when you're doing your storytelling. And, and making your uh, readers kind of confused or, or kind of holding them to uh, the information you, you give them is really important. And let me give you like a classic, this is a classic version. Uh, Frank Miller did this years ago. Uh, he's, he's such a brilliant genius. Um, this was from Daredevil, I believe, and it was one of my favorite scenes. I remember reading this, I think I was a kid when I, when I saw this, I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life, right? So, all you see in the panel one is like these insanely crazy eyes, right? Uh, uh, you know, like, like sweat and stuff kind of pouring down, right? these crazy the eyeballs of a nut job, right? You're like, this guy is out of his freaking mind. Blah! Right? Like just completely crazed eyes like this, you know? And then the, the, the text was great, like, tonight the world will live in fear. Yes. Nowhere will they be able to run or escape me. Right? Psycho! Right? The other panel, same thing. Eyes of a nut job, whacked out, more sweat from the brows. Right? Clearly, like, oh my god, this guy's going, ah, I will eat the blood of the babies. Yes. Ah, ah, I will watch the scary shit, scary shit, scary shit, right? Okay? And then, of course, you flip the page. Right? Because you can't see anything on the, on the other page. And then what does it reveal to you have? Let me get down here. Right. What do you finally see is you find that there's this guy <sighs> with his crazy eyes, right? Covered in bandages. He's like a quadriplegic amputee, right? Right? With the bandages, right? And he's got all these IVs and stuff, right? with fluids and things, right? A little pillow here, right? Right, and they're all just bandages and more IVs and he's in some hospital bed, right? And he's like, tonight they will be in fear of me, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, really, you? 
you know, and he's like, you know, sucking some stuff out of a straw. The nurse is giving, ah, ah, and you realize, oh my God, this guy's twice as fucking crazy, right? Because he's not doing anything, you know, he's just in a bed there, you know? And that's really great storytelling. The kind where, you know, the, he leads you somewhere and you're really thinking of something, and in the end you're like, okay, I, I totally didn't see that coming, right? Okay? And that's usually the trick of being a good storyteller is, is they never really know what's coming, right? Um, you know, when you create a story, you have to realize that you're doing the job of like 50, 60 people, right? If you are a comic book creator, right? You are a film director, right? You are, and let me, let's, let's go over the list of jobs that you have to be proficient at in order to do this, right? You have to be a director, you have to be a film editor, you have to be a cinematographer, you have to be the location scout, right? You have to be the costume designer, you have to be the sound effects guy, right? All those little sound blue, right? You have to be the script editor, right? You have to be the continuity editor, making sure that you guys ever see the movie Pretty Woman? Yeah. Right? Everyone's seen that movie, right? The cheesy movie, right? <coughs> they say in Portuguese, agua com açúcar, which is like sugar and water. It's just so, right, no substance to it, right? It, it's very well known for scenes where the, uh, Julia Roberts is speaking to Richard Gere in the hotel room. And in one scene, and many times in films, they shoot things over several days, right? And they go back and reshoot it again because they decided they wanted to change something. So. If you watch that film, it's kind of notorious for its problems with continuity. So in one scene, she's talking to Richard Gere and she has a pancake in her hand, right? And then they cut to him, they cut back to her, she has no pancake, and now she has a wedding ring on, right? And they cut back to him, now she has French toast and the wedding ring is gone, right? And then in the next thing, she's got no French toast, uh, the wedding ring is back on, then the next one, she's got no wedding ring, a ring on a different finger, and the pancake again. Right, but the pancake now doesn't have a bite in it anymore, right? And it's back and forth, things like that, you know. Um, so you have to do that sort of thing. You have to be the lighting director. Uh, I mean, there's a million different uh, things that you have. You have to be the film historian, right? The, the one who gets all the historical stuff right, the prop uh, director, right? If you're doing a story that takes place in the 60s rock scene, you can't have a guitar amplifier that was made in 1991, clearly, right? Things like that. So. All, all those things like that, right? If you're doing a story uh, of World War II, uh, you know, you're gonna need reference of what, what sort of limousine does Hitler get picked up in, right? It's probably one of those. Now, I would get reference for this, but as someone generally in comics, you have to figure it's probably gonna be like a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes, right? It probably has this sort of big grill like that with that sort of woman on there or the Thing. It probably has those fender, first off has those more bicycle-like wheels, right? Those old automobiles have, probably has that sort of fender that comes up like so, probably has the, the lights that go on the front like that, right? Probably has a fender like this and this one as well, right? And it's a long automobile like so. This has sort of a long nature to it. The windshield is probably like a straight, it didn't have beautiful curved glass, it was straight glass like so, right? And even the door didn't go all the way down. The door went like halfway like this, right? And again, with the fender here, went up like that and around, something like so. Right? Maybe it even had those pipes that go along the side like that, you know? Things like this, you would need to kind of understand definitely before you draw it. And even if you're gonna fake it, you better have a pretty good memory of what sort of stuff. Because they probably didn't even have the blinker lights back then, right? Which are common. The wheels would have spokes, right? like so. Uh, this might have some metal bumper here like that instead, right? They might even have that crank where they had that thing where they had to crank the car up, which is possible. They didn't have the electric starter or something like that. So things like that you kind of have to know when you're doing all this stuff, right? Um, so it, when you're creating your own story, what do you think you need to start with? Oh, yeah. Your plot is a good one. How about a main character, right? Like, yeah. That might be a good idea, right? Yeah. Unless the story is like, well, I'll do one panel on some guy, one panel on this guy, and none of it will make sense, right? So what do you think? You think you got to flesh out your character before you do this, right? Listen, that's where the work comes in, right? 
I mean, if you're creating a bunch of characters in an outer space saga, right? I mean, if you look at Star Wars or Star Trek, Star Trek has been slowly built on by science fiction writers for 50 years now. It's getting pretty crazy, right? You have to ask yourself, well, what kind of money do they use in the future, right? Right? Do, do, what, what, what do they call it? We have, what, a thousand different kinds of currency on this planet alone. What do they use on Galtars 5, right? <laughs> right? Or do they just trade in, like, sunworms? I'll give you five sunworms for that Goltech, right? It's <laughs> a good question, right? Yeah. Right? Uh, who's the main character? What's his name? Where does he come from? Right? What's his motivation in this? Right? What's, you know, in, in any good movie, you need a really good reason why the character dresses up like a bat and runs around at night like, yes. oh, they murdered his parents. Like, yeah, okay, yes. right. no, okay, all right, yes, all right. You need motivation, right? For any, anyone to do anything, right. right? For Mad Max to go, you know, fight those guys or do whatever, you need these kind of motivations, right? Uh, in fact, another thing you might do with the Mad Max scenario is you may want to, again, trick the reader. So now you see uh, this caravan kind of making its way down here, you know, down in the canyon, right? And then you have this sort of road here, and you, you have Mad Max's car now with the smoke and everything, and it looks like it's driving down towards the, the caravan, and you figure he's going to go intercept the caravan of guys, right? And you have the smoke here like this, and he's sort of driving down this sort of road down here. Right, as they're moving this way, right? And then you find as you get down to the next panel that the caravan has now sort of left. They're kind of going off into the distance here, and he's turning in the other direction of where the smoke is coming from, because that's where... <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Now he wants to go check on his wife and daughter, who are now been burned to a crisp. And there's only some bones left and some dirty napkins for where they... Because human flesh is greasy, so they probably had a lot of napkins that they left back there, right? And only by doing this, as they... As you move the characters away here, going down here, do you realize that this thought of him going towards there, or maybe in, even between this panel, you might show another panel. Actually, I think this would be probably more believable. I would do something like this, where we've established him, we've established the car, we've established the dog, we've seen the, the hordes of these guys. So in between this and this one, we could easily have a close-up shot of Mel driving the car, looking intense, right? Hands on the wheel, you know, really angry, really worried, whatever kind of look you want to give him here, right? Right? And this is now, we can work with what we have on his face. We can zoom in close to the character and the emotions on his face now are justified by what we've seen, right? We know that this, this fear of terror and stuff is linked to those vicious marauders that we've seen, right? And the fact that they're definitely going out there to kill, right? Or they're, right? So we can show this, we can show this. We might even zoom in more just on his face before we show this. And you realize that maybe that's when he made the choice not to follow them, but to go in the other direction, right? Okay. Um, but your character, for example, um, is always important. Another thing that you want to do in, in comics is kind of come up with something that is easy to define, right? Okay, let me give you a, let, let me give you an example of classic comic book stuff. Ready? Yeah. I'm going to draw Bruce Wayne for you. Ready? Here we go. First, we start with a basic head, sort of an eye line, center line, right? Here's Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman, right? Sort of handsome fellow, right? Powerful cheekbones, blah, blah, blah. Sort of your generic handsome guy, right? Let's give him some ears. Mm 
Maybe a little slight cliff, nothing too crazy. Right. His intense brows, as every superhero has the intense brow look. <laughs> Intensity. Even when they go shopping, like, are these on sale? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, two for 99. Thank you. All right? Intense. All right? Let's give him a hairline. All right? Here we go. Right. Here's your Bruce Wayne, right? Bruce Wayne, right? Bullshit, Superman. There you go, there you go. All right, a little bit bigger there, right? Superman. Superman? Sure. Bullshit, Tony Stark. There you go, all right? Think that's Tony Stark, here we go, ready? Movie Tony Stark. All right, there you go, all right? Bullshit, Wolverine. Here we go, ready, here we go, all right? Get a little bit of this, a little bit of this. All right, there you go, all right? So, Something as simple as that makes what your character, uh, makes him recognizable by putting in some bizarro mutton chops. Like, who the hell wears mutton chops like this? Like, what, are you kidding me? What is this, 1775, right? It's ridiculous. Okay. But that makes your character easily recognizable, right? And that's like literally the difference between Bruce Wayne and Tony Stark is the Clark Gable mustache. And that's it. That's really all it is. Guess what? Watch this. Now it's Nick Fury. All right, here you go, all right? There you go, that's it. That's the difference. An eye patch. Who wears an eye patch, right? Okay? And that's just another cool identifiable trait. Want to make him even more identifiable here? Big face scar, right? There you go. You know that's the bad guy when he's got a giant face scar, right? Even if he's in the just grocery store like, Oh, great, excellent, okay, I'll take two of the mangoes, like, big face scar, I don't trust that guy. He's gonna kill me with a throwing knife, right? Okay, all right? So, even if you're doing female characters, right, and you wanna separate these characters, you wanna make sure that one of the girls might have a haircut with bangs, right? And she might have a bob haircut, like so. And the other female might have uh, ponytail or something, right? Just to make sure that you can always tell the difference easily from a dif distance, even when you draw them very small, that this character is easily not going to be confused due to this hair, right, as the other girl, even if she also has bangs, right? Okay? Or the other girl's going to have a much curlier haircut or something like that, or she might have dreads, or she might have... Uh, uh, a buzz cut or something like that. Something definitely identifiable. That way it's very easy to separate your characters and they're always recognizable even when you draw them small, right? Okay. Each one of these characters were part of a universe. We had our sort of main bad guy over here. And it was fun because I got to do a lot of little monsters and things like that and these kind of cool devil dog-like characters here and this character Mordair, which we have some posters that I think we're giving away here, by the way. Uh, of our character here, yeah, right? Please uh, feel free if you want me to sign some of those or whatever. And coming up with each one of these characters and their sort of, you know, backstories is a lot of work, you know? And each one of them needs to have a, a, a truly, uh, uh, let's see here. Why is this not? Uh, let's see here. Right. And I remember at one point we were starting to really roll with these guys for a while before like the comic book market really took a tank in like the in the 90s at the time, right? Um, coming up with some of these were also, right? When you're doing stuff like this, this is a different story. This is when you need reference for stuff. If you're going to get this character to get him to look all shiny and metal like this, uh, having photo reference of a character like that, a bodybuilder and using super high contrast to create this sort of metallic look was important, right? And this is a lot of work, guys, doing painted covers and things like that when you're, when you're uh, pushing a, um, let me see what we got here. Uh, when you're gonna be launching something like this, 
you want to make sure that you have an arsenal of, of stuff that you can sell with the characters. Uh, you should have all different kinds of views of what the character looks like from his little tufts of hair that stick out of his elbow there to what kind of uh, actual leg. These are more like animal legs, like so. The proportions, how big his shoulders are compared to his head and this sort of stuff, right? And the more of this stuff you have, um, the more you can uh, sell this. This is done by Joe Jusco, actually. He took the character. We were doing trading cards at the time. And getting a lot of imagery together can be a, uh, can be a real pain in the neck. Before anyone will even buy anything, you need to have a lot of work sort of where people can imagine how cool it's going to look. You don't sell them on, you know, you can tell them all you want, but until they really see things, you know, they don't really know what they're getting. And it's important to have finished, cool work that they can look at and say like, wow, that looks, that looks really cool. Right. And even when you're doing a cover like this, um, you need to, uh, well, let me give you an example of what uh, Vampy Subway cover here. All right. Um, this is a, a Vampirella cover. If you look at it, there's a, a scenario here with Vampirella, and these people were attacked by werewolves on the New York subway. So I had to kind of put together this combination of the figure, like so, and get this realistic subway shot. And let me take, can I uh, blow this up so I have, uh, let me see, a uh, few large icons. Here we go. All right. Um, Here's a semi-finished piece here where you can see the, just the penciling of the part of the subway. <coughs> Even coming up next to her face, there's X amount of where I wanted to uh, uh, paint before I, I got close to the face. I wanted to be very careful how dark or not to surpass that uh, area and go into this delicate area of the face, right? But getting even these uh, shots like so, this is a model J.C. Lanier who's uh, not only in very fit shape, uh, she's a stunt woman now, actually. She works in Hollywood, jumping out of helicopters and stuff like that. Um, but she, uh, and these are, for example, these are the sketches where you start from. These were some ideas where I had her kind of leaning against there uh, with the blood and stuff like that. And I think this is eventually the one that they picked with her kind of leaning like so. And that, from there, that's where we end up getting the finished one. So getting these other poses, I think this was the pose that we sort of settled for, was the angle that I liked. We had some other ones that were a little bit too straight. It was too boring and it didn't have that kind of leaning in, looking for that sort of thing. And then here's the, uh, here's some black and white photo where I bumped the contrast up because there's so many bizarre reflections on the metal of the subway with all the different kind of fluorescent lights and things like that, that, you know, it's darker over here and then it's bright over here and it's super bright here and then it's dark over there. Like, geez, everything, everything is just so bizarre that you really need that photo reference. This is the shot of the actual subway there and it had this yellow urine tint, you know, <laughs> which, which if you've ever been in the New York subway kind of smells like the uh, urine there, right? But then if you look at the finished cover, you can see where that yellow kind of comes into play. I really wanted to steal some of that. I didn't want it to look too <coughs> silver. And then the rest of this stuff is made up. This, this post over here and uh, the blood and this sort of stuff. And some of the things are broken in this area. If you look in the ceiling, some of the tiles have been smashed and some wiring coming down, things like that. The blood, you have to get the highlights of the blood where the highlights of the metal are too, like the little area here. This is dark red, bright red, like that to create that 3D feel. Maybe this is like chunks of guts and brains and stuff, you know, or more coagulated blood. And then the perspective of the puddles, right? To get these sort of like long oval puddles like so, and to get that, right? And of course the floor is completely made up and I put in this yellow and black sort of danger thing in front of the platform. So you take all these elements and put stuff together when you're doing something like this. And when you're Especially when you're creating horror characters or monsters or things that don't really exist, such as that other kind of character that we had. Or this is a good example, if I can uh, take a look here at this Tangarth. This was for, um, this one was for uh, Inquest magazine that did fantasy. And this was basically a giant cow monster. I kid you not. Let me sit on this here. 
And this is the actual final cover. And so it's this kind of cool mythological uh, uh, minotaur character, right? With an axe and these strange beads and stuff. And three-fingered hand. So I had to get some photos of a four-fingered hand and sort of eliminate a finger, right? But getting these, the, the soft lighting in here, if you take a look at the figure, we have this bright yellow lighting, which you can see on little tips of certain parts of the muscles, like so, coming from the, the right side. Clearly, you can see yellow color here to match the highlights of the, of the back over here. And then we have a bluish lighting over here, this green here, where it's catching a different light. And on the other side, we have more of a white lighting that you can see landing on the body, like so. So when you do something like this, you have a combination of stuff. Here are the, the hands that I shot, and I probably used a combination of either this one here or this one here, I think, because of the blue. And I had to use a blue light to match that sort of lighting that the body's getting at that angle, like so, right? So, because uh, what I had for the figure, I got a bodybuilder pose that worked for me, this guy here, right? And here you can see where those orange lights are, like that sort of bright highlights. But this other stuff has nothing to do with that orange color. And you can see the other light coming from the other side, right? So I utilized that and those hands. This was the sketch that I think that they approved at one point. With sketches, I, I try not to spend any time on those at all, because they just look at it and go like, yeah, 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 like it, made it, nah, nah. So, I don't like to spend too much time. Here's one with, I think he was on a pirate ship. He was supposed to be like a, some sort of pirate-like character. And I think here he's holding a sword on top of a deck or something. And I don't know. I didn't like that one either. Can't blame them for not liking it. And then, of course, you needed a cow head. Hi, cow. All right. And I found one. I had another one here. And this one just didn't give me... I got, it gave me some more information about what the eye looks like and ears and stuff like that. And so sometimes you may use one predominantly, but you get others to give you more information. I think I use the highlights of the nose and stuff here. If you look at that, let's get this one here. And that you can see where I stole those highlights there to make that sort of nose. And some of this information, I think I got from the other cow. And a lot of it, sometimes you have to make the match, right? and get all those elements together to create this fictional character that doesn't really exist. So when you're creating these kind of fun things, you gotta kinda really use reference from a lot of different places. And if you can put them all together successfully, you create like a believable, cool character that someone can you know, kind of really, really visualize. Especially in a realistic painting, you want them to believe that this guy actually exists. You know, that uh, uh, you can actually see. And now we have these great computer digital stuff and all these cool movies and you can imagine a, a guy made out of rock walking around and all these kind of cool effects and stuff. And before we had that, we had this. This was the closest you can get to this sort of believable sort of character. And you still want that. You want your readers to believe and buy into the fact that this character exists. So, excuse me, you know, that was, sometimes if you're gonna get, if you're gonna do figure stuff, if you're gonna get nudes and you're gonna like go through tons of different nudes to get a shot of a pose, that'll give you what you need. Mm -hmm. Like that one gave me what I needed. So in that shot, it, she looked like she was moving and I could utilize that and add the costume and still get the contours of her, of her limbs and stuff to get that to work and throw in the panther tail and stuff. And here you can see like the light pencil work that goes into the face before I go in and paint something like that. And in the end still I decided, nah, no, nah, sorry. And ended up with our final, oops piece here, this one, right? And even this, you can see the red for some reason, like it was so hard to get this red to be opaque that I had to paint over it till there were like lumps in it. And it's still, red is not a very uh, uh, opaque uh, color, sadly. This is like a trashy trailer park skank kind of, it's like a uh, Tales from the Crypt. She's like the Crypt Keeper, sort of the, the, the host of the stories. And she also, here she's being electrocuted by zombie prison guards at the prison. And they always had this humorous stuff. And here again, I started doing this. She could take off her face here. This is her like flesh face that she peels off. 
And she still has this little Band-Aid, which I thought was really ridiculous, you know? And I gave her this trashy, dirty old, like, trailer park home with her son has this mullet haircut with the, your, with the cheesy, ridiculous, all this beer cans and Value Mart cheap malt liquor and stuff and rips in her stockings and things like that. Chips, this guy over here, right? He's down for it. These, I, I got to have a lot of fun with that. I think this was the first cover that we ever did, right? With that bad makeup, she looks like a drunken clown, right? And her bad boob job, right? Yeah. Krispy Kreme donuts, which is a, that's probably a, that's an American thing. I don't know if you guys have that yeah, stuff down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. It. It's good. It's yeah, good though. Good stuff. Yeah, it's better than Dunkin' Donuts, right? <laughs> okay, I think that probably wraps this up for time. Thanks for uh, uh, spending your time with me, guys. Trinidad Ross, all right? Okay. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of the show. I'll catch you guys. Six o'clock, we yeah. do another one, right? Yeah. Okay.